The West Side Highway in Manhattan borders the Hudson River and fits the classic definition of infrastructure. It's big and solid, it transports people, and a lot of us who use it don't even notice it's there, especially because not a lot of people in New York drive. To us, it's just an obstacle on the way to the waterfront. But in the industrial times before the mid-20th century, New York's waterfront was a very different place. Manhattan was being expanded using landfill, and the Hudson was a bustling shipping port, with merchant ships delivering the city's lifeblood, including livestock. Passengers also arrived there from transatlantic voyages, where they were greeted with elegant Beaux-Arts-style terminals. As the automobile became an essential form of transit, the West Side Elevated Highway, also known as the Miller Highway, was built along the waterfront between 1929 and 1951. It was one of the earliest urban freeways in the world and the first elevated highway in the United States. Though the Miller Highway's heyday was short, its story, especially compared with the High Line nearby, traces changing attitudes toward historical infrastructure in urban America. Outmoded structures were once seen as useless eyesores, but a fetish for America's industrial past has made some of them desirable to restore and reuse. The Miller was highly ornamented compared to modern highways, proudly decked out in Art Deco flourishes, including iconic lamppost designs and friezes. But by the time it was finished in 1951, it was already an outdated design, too narrow and somewhat dangerous. Not unlike the stalled and fitful infrastructural projects in India described by Akhil Gupta, the Miller was prefigured as a ruin before it was even complete. The Miller's outvotedness stemmed from a lack of maintenance, and the less useful it became, the more it was left to fall apart. Cars couldn't drive on it at highway speeds, and it often took as much as six to eight inches of standing water, giving it the dubious honor of being an elevated structure that could also flood. Then there was the collapse. On December 15, 1973, an 80-foot-long section of the highway's northbound lanes buckled under the weight of an overloaded dump truck that, ironically, was carrying several tons of asphalt meant to repair it. Immediately following the incident, which happened between Little West 12th Street and Gansevoort Street, much of the highway was taken out of service for 15 or so years. Despite being rendered useless, the elevated highway had a colorful afterlife. People turned the surface of the decommissioned highway into a park of their own making, with space for biking, jogging, strolling, and other forms of outdoor recreation. In 1978, the artist Brent Berger and Tia Ballantine created an 800 by 75 foot painting on the highway's surface. It started in between the base of the World Trade Center and the sandy expanse of landfill that would become Battery Park City. The Twin Towers have acquired a suitably overscale sibling in what may be the world's largest painting, wrote Village Voice critic Roderick Mason Faber. The sublime quality of this ambitious project by two creative individuals tangled with the ineptness, infighting, and entropy among city planners, government officials, and civic organizations. Despite government dysfunction forming the canvas, it's worth noting that the 130 gallons of paint used in the project were all government surplus. On a more intimate scale, the overpass and the waterfront around it were playing host to a conurbation of other informal and unintentional communities. The secluded areas underneath the roadway and the collapsing ruins of the adjacent Hudson River piers were a cruising hotspot for local gay men. The area had had this reputation since World War I, but the wreckage, with its ghosts of half a million transient sailors, held an extra aesthetic dimension for the current population. There were also art shows in the pier buildings nearby. Between 1971 and 1983, the pier buildings were home to site-based installations, photography, murals, and performances by Vito Acconci, Peter Hujar, Gordon Matta Clark, Tava, Arthur Tress, and David Wojnarowicz's now legendary and long lost guerrilla art show on the Ward Line Piers with artist Mike Bidlow. The area under the elevated highway also became part of an informal infrastructure for the local homeless population. In 1970, trans activists of color, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, founded the STAR, short for Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, providing food and clothing to the homeless queer youth living and congregating there. In 1989, with the demolition of the highway about to commence, officials were forced to reckon with about 40 homeless people living in the secluded area under the overpass and try to find somewhere for them to go. The remains of the highway were also home to a very different kind of urban survivor. 
All the standing water on the highway was certainly not good news structurally, but slowly and silently, the wind was depositing tiny strips of seed and sediment on the surface. By about eight years after its closure, the highway had become host to 477 woody plants, including 11 families, 13 genera, and 18 species. The West Side Highway's alluring and menacing industrial waste covered by incipient plant life called to mind a much more iconic structure just one avenue away. The High Line was an abandoned section of the elevated New York Central Railroad, and like the West Side Highway, it went to seed after manufacturing and shipping left New York, and also became a medium for urban exploration and art. But its useful life stretched out just a little longer, with the occasional train running across it into the 1980s. By the 90s, plans to demolish it were met with the Friends of the High Line, an organization led by the likes of Diane von Furstenberg and Martha Stewart, who were becoming increasingly exemplary of the people moving into the area. With their vision, money, and clout, the High Line is now a linear park attracting 8 million visitors a year. If the timing had been different, could the West Side Highway have seen a similar rehabilitation? One of the differences between the two structures is that the High Line had a more specific link to New York's industrial past, did not have to be directly replaced as freight transportation changed. By contrast, car culture had become even more dominant and it became impossible to imagine Manhattan without a major artery on its west side. Still, the denizens of the West Side Highway area had some prophetic dreams. As a gay man in a story by Andrew Hollering called Nostalgia for Mud imagines, there could be a separate world where the beauty of the ruins can remain unspoiled by gentrification. When the shoreline is made pretty by city planners, and the meatpacking district is given over entirely to boutiques and card shops, then we'll build an island in New York Harbor, composed entirely of rotting piers, blocks of collapsed walls, and litter-strewn lots. The sexiness of detritus and wreckage for these characters, however, has now been sublimated into a commercialized lust for bourgeois bohemianism, with occasional nods toward the rough and artistic past that drew developers' attention in the first place. The gentrified city and the island of its escape have become one and the same.